Welcome to the first and last Fossil G talk on GeoTip.js. Uh, not really, there's been a lot of them. Um, <laughs> but if, if you find this talk interesting, I'd definitely go and check out some of the ones from Bucharest Fossil G. Uh, I owe a lot of yeah, work to, to the guys from EOX in Austria. They kind of started the whole GeoTIFF.js thing. Um, yeah, so as far as what I actually do, I make web map apps with distributed job processing backends uh, for natural hazard modeling. Uh, so for example, this is for wildfire modeling. Uh, so it lets you kind of draw a bunch of polygons on a map, uh, and then it will, you can set a bunch of parameters, uh, and then you can run it somewhere in the cloud, and then it will spit out a geotiff, which you can then show up in a map. Um, so you can also look, you know, it spits out a few different layers as well. Uh, climate change risk analysis. So this is also, this is just visualizing geotiffs in the web browser. Um, it's kind of cropped it a little bit. There we go. Um, so that you can then draw a polygon on the map and it will kind of average the values over that area over a bunch of geotiffs. Uh, evacuation simulation. So this is kind of similar to the wildfire simulation in that we've got a fire here and we want to evacuate a certain area. Um, and so this is Every single day, uh, the state government of Victoria will run 330,000 bushfires or so, uh, roughly in a grid across the state. So that results in 300, over like millions of millions of geotiffs because they run it for different weather scenarios. Uh, so this lets you kind of look at an overview of all of these geotiffs and then you can point in and actually look at individual fires as well. Uh, and then this is flood simulation. So this is actually not using geotiffs in the browser, but at some point it will. Uh, this is just using WMS uh, and Terrier. Uh, so some of the JavaScript libraries that I use to do this, uh, Angular and Prime, Prime is a UI library, that's what I use, uh, and then Mapbox is what I mainly use, but we're slowly moving everything over to Terrier and Cesium for that 3D goodness. Um, and then the, the highlighted libraries at the bottom are what, are gonna, what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so D3, I'm assuming most of you are aware of. Uh, Plotty is a library which will take the GeoTIFF data and spit it to a canvas, an HTML canvas, so you can actually see it. Uh, GeotiffJS is the, the powerhouse of the talk that does all of the de decoding, uncompressing, and all that crazy stuff to actually get useful information out of a GeoTIFF. Uh, GeoRaster provides some really nice functions for calculating you know, statistics from GeoTIFFs. Uh, and then you've also got GPU.js, which allows you to run matrix algebra on, on GeoTIFFs. Uh, and then GeoBlaze, um, Actually, sorry, I got those two mixed up. GeoRaster wraps up GeoTIFF.js. GeoBlaze is the library that actually does the processing of the GeoTIFFs. So as far as showing a GeoTIFF in a web map, uh, I'm not going to talk about what a GeoTIFF is because I'm going to assume everyone knows what that is. Um, people would use web map, web, mapping service, web map services. Sorry. So the usual steps to do that is you would load your GeoTIFF into a WMS server, GeoService, what I usually use, but there are a few others. Um, you would create a style to map the values of that GeoTIFF to, well, pixel values. So usually it'd just be a color ramp, you know, if you want to fade from one color to another, if you've got some sort of grayscale GeoTIFF, uh, then you'd have to publish that. Uh, and then a client, Mapbox, Leaflet, whatever, can request the static image tiles from the, from the WMS server. So I guess we're done, right? We don't really need to talk about visualizing GeoTIFFs in the browser. Well, maybe. Um, so if you're creating GeoTIFFs on demand, which is what I'm doing, um, that extra step of having to publish it to a geo server, kind of set the styling of it to, to fetch it is a little bit too hard for me. Um, and if you want interactive dynamic styling, it can be done with geo server, but every single time you change a parameter, it's loading a whole new set of tiles. Um, so it can be a bit painful. You want to inspect the raw values of the GTIF. Because you're getting image tiles, you don't actually have the raw information there. You don't have the values of each pixel. You can get that, but each time you want to request values, it's a new HTTP request. So then, okay, so you want to run a script on the values. You can't do that either because you don't actually have the values in the web browser. And then me, I have millions and billions of GeoTIFFs that I need to be able to access. I don't want to put those in a Geo server. So many requests. Even if the browser already has the data, you have to keep requesting Geo server for more and more tiles. Forget that. We have GeoTIFF.js, the WebGL. It's down the bottom, you can't see it. says, I'm joking, WMS is not rubbish. WMS is awesome. Just, <laughs> just don't, don't want to upset too many people. Um, so GeoTIFF.js, there's one step there. I've oversimplified this for effect. Um, so you've got your client, your request, and you render the GeoTIFF. You don't need a server there at all. So here you go, single layer. 
oh, you want to change this color scale? This is just me flicking through some of the color scales built into D3. Um, you can set this to whatever you want. And it's all real time because the, the, the data is already in the browser. Uh, you want to set min and min max values. You want to clamp. Uh, you can do that too, all in real time. Uh, you can also do fancy, fancy things like blending. So it's kind of hard to see on there. But I've got a layer that kind of goes, that's got the magma color scale, if you're familiar with that. Um, and I've got that overlaid on top of like just aerial photography to highlight certain areas. OK, so we've solved visualizing GTIFs in the browser now. Um, now I want to look at web-based GTIF analytics. So I guess the usual me method that people use for this is web processing service. Um, so somewhat similar to, to web map service, you have to write, well, similar in that you need to have a server there and you have to publish things. So, so I guess the, the way that I use web processing services, I would write a Python script which would read in you know, chunks of data from web coverage service, or you could read in the GeoTIFF file directly. You do some sort of processing on it and then you would return the result. And so you would then take that Python script and load it into a WPS server like PyWPS. Uh, then you'd have to publish the server, and then a client can make requests to that WPS server to get you know, certain results. Yeah, so this is pretty cool too. Uh, but I already have the data in the browser. Why am I making more requests to the server? And let's say I want to make hundreds of requests, of requests using the same data in real time. More requests to the server, ridiculous. But we can also do this in JavaScript in the browser. Uh, so, for example, this is contouring. Um, so I've got a GeoTIFF there, and I'm just running a D3 contouring uh, matching squares algorithm on that, and that's all in real time. So you can't see, but I'm just dragging a little time slider at the bottom to do that. Um, and then you can also generate like bands or ISO bands as well, if that's, if that's what you're after. Uh, and then the st statistics I was talking about, um, so I've just drawn a polygon on a map, and this is looking at uh, climate projection temperature threshold data set. Um, so it is going through a layer for each month, and then I've got two different years there. So there's 24 GeoTIFFs in total, and it will calculate the average value over that polygon in real time. Uh, raster algebra. Uh, so this fun formula calculates wet bulb temperature using um, maximum temperature and relative humidity. Um, so you can then take that and yeah, calculate layers on the fly. Uh, so here I've got the maximum temperature it's just a climate projection for 2090. Uh, then I've also got relative humidity. And so I can take those and crunch them into something else completely. That works too hard. Yeah. I'm going to gloss over the details of that because it's too horrific. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what, how? Um, yeah, so the libraries that I'm using, as I said before, GeotiffJS uh, is used to fetch and decode the data. Uh, GeoRaster provides a nice wrapper over that. Um, Plotty is what's used to, to convert the actual pixel values into a canvas, which can be displayed. Uh, and then as far as analytics, GeoBlaze, GPU.js, and a little bit of D3. Uh, so yeah, GTF.js does all the hard work, uh, reads your file. It also supports HTTP range requests. So if you've got some massive GeoTIFF and you don't want to read the whole file in, you can say, I want some bounding box, I want some subset of bands, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then also decodes and supports um, most of the common um, compression for GeoTIFFs. Uh, I won't show you code. Um, GeoRaster, so it's a wrapper around GeoReference -re -ge rasters. Um, so it really simplifies how you use GeoTIFF.js. Um, it also support, supports NetCDF, JPEG, and PNG as a wrapper. It doesn't actually have a library in there to fetch those. Hopefully at some point um, I'll be able, to be able to use NetCDFs as well. Uh, Plotty, as I said, will convert those pixel values to Canvas API. Uh, you also have a few things there to set the value domain clamping. You can do a bit of raster band algebra as well. Um, and then GeoBlaze, basic statistics, band arithmetic, histogram generation. So this is all on the CPU, so it's great, but there are limitations. Uh, the GPU.js is a bit magical. Um, so this allows you to run kernel functions on a bunch of matrices. Um, so, yeah, I showed you an example of Rust calculation. I've also seen it do fancy interpolation, interpolation and reprojection stuff. So that's a bit outside of my expertise. And then D3, so I showed you the contouring and isobands. Uh, but you can also do it, you can use it to generate streamlines, arrows, barbs, and yeah, other, other crazy stuff with D3. Uh, so if you want to play with this stuff now, uh, geotiff.io is probably the easiest place to, to have a look. That will let you load your own geotiffs in. 
uh, has access to, has all of the GeoBlaze functions there, so you can draw a polygon on a map and you can get your minimum value, you can get a histogram and that kind of thing. Uh, if you use Leaflet, there's a Geo Raster layer for Leaflet, so that really simplifies all of this because it works as any other layer in Leaflet. You just kind of give it a URL to a GeoTIFF and it will handle all the, the extra complexity. Uh, Open Layers also has the same thing. Cesium slash Terrier Mapbox don't have anything yet, but soon will, especially Terrier. Uh, but both of these support canvas layers. So if you are using Plotty to render a GTIF to a canvas, you can just give Cesium or Mapbox that canvas and it will kind of handle everything for you. So limitations. File size, yeah, you have to download these files into the browser. So if you've got massive files, it doesn't really work. Um, some ways of overcoming this are using cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. Um, so they're kind of layout friendly for network consumption, so you can tile them. So it's kind of a GeoTIFF, but you can have different zoom levels. It has overviews. Um, it's all, yeah. So it means that you can really easily extract out small chunks of like hundreds of gigabytes of GeoTIFF if you want to. Um, Reprojection, mm, I was just, yeah. <laughs> Client side computation, yeah, as I said, because you're loading files into the browser, you have, to, you have to uncompress, you have to decode the GTIF in the browser. So if you're using some potato of a computer, it's probably not going to work well. It does work on a mobile phone, but yeah, it's, it's not great. Uh, and then analyzing values as well, like if you're doing number crunching, there are obvious li limitations in JavaScript to do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, web map service is service oriented, whereas all the stuff I've showed you is not. It needs to run in the browser. Um, I mean, you could run it all in Node.js, but don't. Um, Python stuff is better for that. Um, so if you actually want to have an API, you know, for example, with the raster calculation that I showed you, if you want to have an API where people can go and actually run that and get, you know, values for certain points, um, this stuff doesn't really work. It's more for client side interactive kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I guess that this kind of comes into the client side complexity as well. If you just want to show static imagery, so just RGB, aerial imagery, satellite imagery, this stuff's probably not going to be worth it. Um, maybe if you're doing, maybe if, you're, if you've got hyperspectral imagery and you want to be able to play with the bands in the browser or something like that, but, but for static imagery, I don't think this is worth it at all. All right, demo. Uh, okay, so this is, the, this is the bushfire demo I was talking about. Uh, so I could just click on a map. I won't go into the, the details of it, but yeah, so this will run, a, this will run the simulation somewhere in the cloud, uh, and then it spits out a GTIF, which will then show up on a map. Um, so this kind of shows you the, the real-time contouring. So it's pretty fast. I didn't write this. This is all D3. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and so, so as far as something a little bit more complex goes, this is the... Oh, you can't say that. Let me just change the, change the color scale to something a bit better. Yeah. That's not great, but at least you can see it. Um, so this is showing, yeah, a grid of kind of fire simulations across Victoria. So they're about 330,000 points. Um, and so at the moment, they're colored by extent of the fire, so the, 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 the size of the bushfire simulation. Uh, and so you can zoom in and click on a point, and it will load a GeoTIFF for that fire simulation. So, yeah, if you wanted to try and do this in WMS, that would just be... Yeah, very, very painful. Where are the GeoTIFFs that you're rendering there? This is all local at the moment, yeah. But they're all very small, yeah. yeah. So most of the time is in um, decompressing and um, decoding GeoTIFF, yeah. Um, so another example I've got is with the climate rejections. I'll, I'll finish with something light-hearted. Um, so this is, at the moment, I'm combining uh, maximum temperature and relative humidity climate projections to show wet bulb temperature. Uh, if you don't know what the it is, I'm not going to explain it because it's, yeah, I'd rather not think about it. <laughs> um, so, so this is actually, so you've got, a, you've got a few options to change kind of dimensions, I guess, here. So this has all just been extracted out of NetCDF files uh, of climate projections. So this has resulted in about half a million GeoTIFFs. Um, and so you can change the emission scenario. Uh, so RCP45 is, we, we, you know, sort out our issues with carbon emissions, and 8.5 is the trend that, that we're on at the moment. Um, and so I've, I've got about seven different projections here as well. And so you can just flick through these, uh, and it will just re recalculate for each one. 
Uh, it will also cache the values as well. So once you've loaded those in, you can flick between them quite quickly. Uh, so if you want to go through the months as well, you can kind of see how it moves up as you would expect. Yeah, but because we're loading everything into the browser, it makes it very interactive. So if you're interested in, try not to be too morbid, uh, <laughs> the 35, 35 degree wet bulb temperature is kind of the level where it's uninhabitable. Um, but yes, you can see that if you, if you want to like look at specific values, you can just change the minimum and maximum and that will just update in real time. Um, something I did want to do for this talk, but I ran out of time. Um, is I wanted to actually be able to play with the formula and have it update in real time, but I didn't have that either. But you could pretty easily come up with some sort of GUI to, to be able to change that formula and actually see what it's doing to the data in real time. Yeah. Yeah, so as far as future stuff goes, uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFFs, uh, what I was talking about. Um, I do really want to see if I can get static imagery or just satellite imagery working well in this. Um, my, I, yeah, my initial kind of thoughts are it's not going to be doable because it's just too much data. Um, and the, the performance, um, I guess, increases you get with like caching tiles through GeoServer, that kind of thing, I think are going to beat that. But I've had people tell me that it's doable, so maybe. Uh, NetCDFs would be great because, as I was saying, those climate projections, I've crunched into 500,000 GeoTIFFs, which is just ridiculous because they came from about 40 NetCDFs. So it'd be lovely if I could skip that step and just kind of pull extents um, and, and, you know, slices from the NetCDFs. Uh, reprojection, I've seen cool things where people do that. I just haven't tried it. So, like, yeah, hopefully I can find someone else that's done it and just steal from them. Uh, caching, it's a, like very basic caching, but yeah, because we're loading stuff into the browser, you want to kind of keep as, as much data around as possible so you're not requesting stuff from the server, but you also don't want to crash the browser. Uh, and yeah, as I said, a, a GUI raster formula would be pr pr pretty cool to, to have a look at. Uh, so there's other cool things. Uh, so this is generating hillshade uh, from digital elevation model with WebGL. So this is all stuff you could do as well. Uh, yeah, here's a kind of an example of, of uh, equi, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, equi rectangular image of the world reprojected as azimuthal equal area. So it's totally doable, it's just a matter of making it work. This is all something really cool. So this is, this is done by the EOX company I was talking about. Uh, so this is 3D GeoTIFFs. So they've just got a bunch of slices of GeoTIFF uh, and then they've just kind of clamped the value so you can see through them. Um, and so you can see them kind of panning through there. So I haven't done anything like this, but that's pretty awesome. I'd love to try. Yep. Cool. I think that's probably it. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Nick. I, I'm really excited about GeoTIFF JS and bringing analysis to the client side. I think that. Um, Vector tiles is already doing it in a really cool way with vectors, and so yep. rasters are better, so let's do that. Yep. I'm interested in your thoughts, and you sort of touched on it around how to get the data into the client. So you said that you have lots of little um, yeah. uh, geotiffs, and that's what you're working with now. Like, is, there, is WCS or I uh, see something else like that going to be a solution? Yeah, because well, talking to people about, yeah, dealing with these massive NetCDF files, a lot of them have said that Reading, reading chunks from that CDF file is really fast, especially if you have a WCS server. Yep. Um, but I've just never tried it. So that's another thing. I, I want to be able to compare to see, yeah, the, the difference in, I guess, bandwidth and that kind of things yeah. between different approaches. But I'm not sure. I happen to know of a case where we store lots, where someone stores a lot of <laughs> geotiffs, yep. lots of small ones. And if we could read the overviews from some of them and do... Oh, yes, yeah, that's something you know, I like completely forgot to mention. So, yeah, if, if I've got like a million geotiffs and I want to be able to drill through each one of those, this it, it's impossible yeah. Yeah, with my yeah. approach, yeah. 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 Okay. which is what NetCDFs can do quite well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Questions? Um, 
So I'm guessing a lot of these geotiffs can then be just stored in S3 bucket somewhere. Yep. So have you dealt with any authentication there? I mean, and I mean more complex like uh, having a login server that might automatically pop Well, see, what I was using backups. did. Um, so I was, well, I, even, oh, I think I used JSON web tokens for that um, because I'm just running a kind of a web server in Node.js for all this stuff. Um, as far as authenticating with S3, I don't know how people do it. Do they just proxy stuff? Or, oh yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't I think usually I'm either fetching the data using S3 API or, yeah, that's actually it. Yeah, so sorry, no, I don't, I'm not sure. There's lots of ways to do it. You can is the short answer. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, Dave. Yeah, so there are a number of groups in the US that are using cloud optimized geotiffs for satellite imagery and uh, along with the spatiotemporal asset catalog. Have you done some work into stack yet? No. No, no okay. Cool. All right. Okay, cool. We should talk. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> no further questions? One more. How about in terms of uh, data usage, do you format for that so you're not loading the entire, even if you're loading a small geotiff, you're still loading a lot of data into your browser yeah. at that time? Do you manage it with overviews or anything? At the moment, sort, or? everything that I've done loads the entire file um, because that's, yeah, that's just all I've needed to do. Um, but the, the libraries I'm using will handle that um, if you need to. Yeah, I've just never actually done it, so sorry, I'm not sure. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Thanks. Nice.